On Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Shea. One of the country's most prestigious universities, with one of the world's largest endowments, has joined the student-led movement to divest from fossil fuels. Stanford University's Board of Trustees announced Tuesday it would no longer invest in coal mining companies because of climate change concerns. The board said it acted in accordance with guidelines that let them consider whether, quote, corporate policies or practices create substantial social injury when choosing investments. Stanford's endowment is valued at $18.7 billion. The university's president, John Hennessy, said in a statement, quote, moving away from coal in the investment context is a small but constructive step, while work continues at Stanford and elsewhere to develop broadly viable sustainable energy solutions for the future. All of this comes as the fossil fuel divestment movement heats up across the country. Seven students at Washington University in St. Louis were arrested last week following a 17-day sit-in. The students were calling on the school's board of trustees to cut ties with coal industry giant Peabody Energy. Also last week, students at Harvard blockaded the office of Harvard President Drew Faust. One student was arrested. For more, we go to Stanford University in California, where we're joined by Michael Penuelas. He is a junior, majoring in Earth Systems. He's been a faculty liaison and one of the lead student organizers with Fossil Free Stanford. Welcome to Democracy Now! Um, talk about this victory, Michael, that um, you have had. Talk about the significance of what Stanford has done. Certainly. Good morning. It's an honor to be with you. Um, so this, this move, this victory, is, is a major one in the climate movement, and it's a major one for the divestment movement specifically. Um, this is one of the first major uh, acknowledgments on the part of, a, of a, the administration of a major university that anthropogenic climate change is a risk and that the dollars that we are investing and funding our education off of uh, contribute to that pretty directly. Um, so we're, we're incredibly excited and we're That's proud of our university term that they've That's interesting that you've used, anthropogenic, uh, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, explain what anthropogenic means. Sure. Uh, man-made, man-made climate change. We are the drivers, and our burning of fossil fuels are, are the primary drivers of this climate change. So Michael, can you explain how it is that you organized this campaign and how you got as many people, students and professors, involved uh, that led to its success? Sure. So our generation is one of the first to have been raised the entire, you know, the entirety of our lives with this looming specter of climate change on the horizon. But tangible action that can be taken is is often evasive. Um, so when this opportunity presented itself to take our voices and unite them as students to leverage the power and the name of our institution that that represents us and that we represent, uh, I think students were really really excited and they jumped on board. Um, we had recently an election on campus where over 2,700 students voted in favor of divestment. We've had hundreds of faculty, quite you know, quite literally, almost 200 now, um, send expressions of of support to our campaign um, because they know that this is something that they can do, and they know that institutional action right now is what needs to happen to create concrete uh, change in our country in terms of a positive direction for climate action. Um, but also just to create this bigger space for dialogue, because our institutions have names and they need to be part of that. I'm reading from The New York Times right now. It says the university said it acted in accordance with internal guidelines that allow its trustees to consider whether, quote, corporate policies or practices create substantial social injury, unquote, when choosing investments. Coal status is a major source of carbon pollution linked to climate change. So, uh, practically, what does this mean? Are you talking about Stanford divesting from some, what, 100 companies globally? Yes, it does. It means that Stanford's going to remove all of its direct investments in, in a list of companies. We presented them a list of the 100 coal companies with the largest fossil fuel reserves, the largest amount of carbon in their reserves. Um, and they're going to set up some dynamic parameters uh, by which companies can enter and exit that list as, as their control of those reserves change. But yeah, practically, that's exactly what that means, is that Stanford is going to stop supporting them and stop funding our education. Um, on those companies, those, those approximately 100 companies that are, that are mining and extracting the coal.
I want to turn to Harvard. Last Wednesday, six students with the Divest Harvard campaign blockaded the main entrance to University President Drew Faust's office and called for an open meeting about fossil fuel divestment. This is climate justice activist Tim DeChristopher, who is now a student at the Divinity School, speaking at a rally after the action. And leadership is something that the campaign to divest from fossil fuels has been asking of Harvard for two years now. We've been asking them to be a leader on confronting the climate crisis and taking responsibility for our investments. And so finally, yesterday, Harvard took some leadership and became the first school in the country to arrest its own student for requesting a public dialogue about fossil fuel divestment. That's, that's not exactly the kind of leadership that we were looking for as an institution with $32 billion in our endowment. As long as that money is invested in global markets, it has a global impact. That, that $32 billion is 32 billion connections to the broader world. And every one of those connections has an impact on real human lives. And every one of those 32 billion connections has a responsibility that comes with that impact. Yep. And Harvard has a responsibility to hear the voices at the other ends of those 32 billion dollars. That was Harvard Divinity School student and climate activist Tim De Christopher speaking at a Divest Harvard rally last week. Last year, De Christopher was released after serving 21 months in jail for interfering with a 2008 public auction when he disrupted the Bush administration's last-minute move to sell off oil and gas exploitation rights in Utah. So, Michael, could you talk about how it is that Stanford's campaign was so successful and Harvard and other universities have responded so poorly? Uh, to uh, students' campaigns to divest from fossil fuels. So this this juxtaposition between st the administration at Stanford's response and the administrations at other schools, Harvard and Washington University, most notably in the last week, um, is really a, an unfortunately salient one, and, and one that I think is being rightfully made uh, in media across the country right now. And it's the fact that that Stanford maintained an open dialogue now for for almost 18 months with students meeting regularly and considering our concerns. And when. 78 percent of our, our undergraduate body stands up and, and asks for divestment and states that they want Stanford's uh, endowment and its money to be uh, brought in line with its core values, they, they listened. And I think Stanford's come out on the right side of history, um, and other schools haven't up to this point. Um, but but I, I think that one of the most important points to be stressed on this is that there is still time for these other universities to go ahead and, and take that step and follow Stanford and the other schools that have come even before Stanford's lead. Um, and I think I would actually say that that's, it's, it's integral at this point that for the success of, of our, our society in terms of moving past fossil fuels, these other universities do recognize the calls of those students that um, they've been reacting so negatively to thus far. Groups across the country who are fighting Peabody Energy have put out the call for a national day of action for tomorrow, when the company holds its annual shareholder meeting in St. Louis. In a related effort, as you mentioned, Michael, students at Washington University's St. Louis campus held a 17-day sit-in campaign to remove Peabody Energy CEO Greg Boyce from the school's board of trustees. At a rally on campus in April, students laid out their there are other demands for the university to cut ties with the coal industry giant. We have a general concern for corporate responsibility and accountability. We want to hold WashU accountable for the relationships that they have with these corporations. Um, and we just really um, are concerned with the social injustices that Peabody perpetrates daily. Um, we have concern for um, the way that Peabody destroys communities and destroys the environment. Um, and we want um, we don't want WashU uh, to be a part of the fact that Peabody launders their reputation through universities and nonprofits and philanthropy. Yeah. So we really Woo! want that. So our second ask directly addresses that. We feel that the university um, does not, and the administration in particular, does not acknowledge the social injustices that Peabody commits. And so we ask that Chancellor Wrighton visit frontline communities of Peabody's coal mining operations. Um, and our third ask is that um, WashU change the name of the Consortium for Clean Coal Utilization to something that represents a non-industry term, um, because clean coal does not exist. <laughs> 
Washington University students speaking at a rally on campus in April. And this is another student, Sam Lai, addressing Peabody Cole's CEO, Greg Boyce. He reads a poem by Vern Benali, a resident of Black Mesa, Arizona, which has felt the effects of Peabody's extraction. The poem is called Dear Mr. Boyce. Dear Mr. Boyce, I've been thinking a lot about genocide, about my American inheritance, about haunted ground, fleeing homes, and the creation of ghosts, about the lessons of American history. Mr. Boyce, I haven't heard the phrase forceful relocation of Native Americans since high school history class. I didn't think I would have to. I haven't thought about what it's like to breathe coal dust in a long time either. To open your window and feel a sting in your eyes. To sneeze and watch the tissue turn black. To develop asthma at the age of 22 because you play soccer in your backyard. I know. It isn't easy to make energy and make profit without destroying the environment or exploiting workers, but it's not our job to come up with solutions. It's yours. You get paid a lot to come up with solutions. That's Washington University student Sam Lai addressing Peabody Cole's CEO Greg Boyce, reading part of a poem by Fern Benali, a Black Mesa resident. Uh, I want to thank you very much, Michael, for being with us uh, from Stanford University. Michael Penuelas is a junior at Stanford and an organizer with the Fossil Free Stanford. Again, the university has just decided to purge $18 billion, $18.7 billion, of its endowment of coal stock.